Hi, this is X, and you're listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. Thanks for tuning in again this week. We are excited to have here with us on the show Jeff Pardo. Jeff is a Grammy-nominated producer and writer. He's had countless number ones and has written for artists such as Lady Annabellum, Mandisa, Colton Dixon, Hilary Scott, and Micah Tyler. We had a chance to sit down with him and talk to him about his journey from being a touring musician, doing hundreds of dates a year, to a full-time songwriter and producer. We've known Jeff for a long time and have had the privilege of working with him on several projects, including our first FCM Records release, Tears, by Matt Hammett, which Jeff co-wrote and co-produced. Jeff shares with us his take on the writing process, the power of collaboration, and how having a solid definition of what success is for you specifically will keep you from feeling like you're always failing. Before we jump in, though, we just want to share with you a message about the Music Makers Bootcamp. So maybe you've heard of our Music Makers Bootcamp. We've received rave reviews already, and you might have been able to attend one of ours. We do them from time to time, a couple times a year in Franklin, Tennessee. Good news is we have a waiting list up at fullcirclegoeslive.com because you'll be at the very front of the list and have priority access to tickets for the very next time that we announce one, which will be coming up very soon. So head over to fullcirclegoeslive.com. These events have been described as life-changing, as very helpful, as very tangible. We try to get the best industry experts together under one roof to come and share their insights and knowledge about the music business so it doesn't have to be some big secret, some big mystery. So that's the Music Makers Boot Camp, a condensed weekend of intense learning and education and networking. So check that out. It's at fullcirclegoeslive.com. Get on the waiting list and don't miss your opportunity to get to the next one. So we're in the studio today with Jeff Pardo. Jeff, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. It's great to be here. Great having you, man. Thanks for finally coming. We were finally able to get you on the show for you to share your story yes. and give the kids a glimpse into your life. Give the kids a glimpse. Give the kids a glimpse into your life and yeah. to share with them what you do and how you do it. If you yeah. don't mind, can you give our listeners like a little tale into your history, a little backstory so they yeah. know where you're coming from? Yeah, I'm happy to. So I grew up, maybe most importantly, I grew up in Chicago, Illinois. I'm a massive Cubs and Bears fan. Then go Cubs. Yes, go Cubs. It's a new year. We're going to repeat. This is going to happen. I'm, you know, 108 years, no World Series, then two in a row. This is what we're all hoping that, for. That, that's, that's where it's at. So yeah, I grew up up there. I was always really active musically from a pretty early age. I think I started playing piano in, I think, third grade. And, and the funny thing is I started writing songs or pieces of music or whatever pretty shortly after I started playing piano. I bet it was fourth or fifth grade when cool. I wrote my first song. So I was always really, yeah, pretty musically exploratory and yeah, yeah. active all the way through high school. When I was done with school, I came down to go to Belmont University okay. here in Nashville. And I studied commercial music, just like everybody does when they come <laughs> to Belmont. Of course. So I studied piano. Uh, and, and when I was in college, you know, I think that's when I began to see my gift as a side person. Mm -hmm. When I was in Chicago, I thought I wanted to come down to Nashville and be an artist and Mm -hmm. be in Christian music and be an artist. I'd grown up listening to Stephen Curtis and Michael W. Smith and these guys and Billy, and then, you know, Billy Joel and Bruce Hornsby, like a lot of these great piano. Yeah, piano vocal. Yeah. And I didn't really know that there was this option to be a songwriter, be a Mm -hmm. producer and be someone who was kind of the man behind the curtain a little bit. And what was interesting, when I came to Belmont, I started to notice that my friends were really responding positively when I was in a position of being the helper, being the mm-hmm. side man. And then Jeff, the artist, was always a little bit like, eh, that's not all that awesome. You See, know, it, it was never compelling, yeah, yeah. me as the front guy. Yeah, yeah. But when I was in a studio, the student studios there, or when I was co-writing with, with another student, um, when I was playing keyboards for people, yeah. That was the thing that people responded to, and so it was probably in my like sophomore junior year. I kind of put my eggs in the in that basket, Mm -hmm. and said, "This is what I'm going to focus on." Yeah. So after you got out of school, so you started doing more behind the scenes stuff, doing more producing, playing, writing, and touring, which was a big part of my early. So when did you get on the road? Was it while you were still in college, or did it happen after you got out of school? Yeah. So it was was while I was in school. Um, There was a band. This would have been. 2002, Mm -hmm. I guess. 
there was a band that had come out of Belmont University. It was this big band. It was called Denver and the Mile High Orchestra. Okay. And Denver was this guy. It was this guy's name. He was the lead singer, and he had put this band together in college initially just to play some songs that had been a, like arrangements. Yeah. He was in his horn arranging class, and he put this band together. And then they did one of student showcases, and they won it, and they ended up getting this small little indie record deal with a company that's no longer around. Mm-hmm. But it was it was at the end of the like late 90s early 2000s swing revival yeah i remember those days yeah right brian setzer and yeah absolutely all that stuff so my freshman year i started playing as kind of a sub piano player with okay. them and it was a blast i mean it was it was seven piece horn section four piece rhythm section denver was singing and we were playing this you know kind of horn driven stuff it started it was mostly swing by the end of it it was a little bit of like Earth, Wind & Fire, Tower of Power influence, that kind of stuff. But I I joined the band, my junior year of college was when I joined the band full time. And so then I became the student that was like missing as many classes as the professors would allow because I was touring. And so for me, like right now, I'm I've been off the road for three years, and I'm just in town, uh, you know, focusing on writing and production. But touring for me was really the thing out of school that allowed me to start paying my bills with music. And I think for a lot of people who go to music school, that's the the first and sometimes the hardest transition from being a student to being a professional. Yeah. How do I make money right now? Yeah. And how do you how, get right in making some yeah. Yeah. Some how money. do I how do I pay my rent? How yeah. do I buy food? And so yeah, touring and, and being a keyboard player was really my initial you know, entrance into the music business. So how long were you with Denver and the Mile High Orchestra? Yeah, so I was with them for seven years. Okay. I think I seven, seven or eight years. Yeah, and that was a crazy time. I mean, you know, the first big summer tour we had, I remember we were gone like for three or four weeks straight. Mm-hmm. We're all hardly making any money, but we're making just enough. And we were all yeah. young, kind of in our early 20s. And I guess some guys were their upper 20s, but... We're on this terrible, like, they found this tour bus that some guy was willing to lease the band for the summer that was awful. And then we found out that basically the guy was a criminal. And at some point, the bus actually got impounded. And, and so, I mean, it was, it was like, it was, it could have been, a, like, that tour that summer could have been a sitcom. I yeah. mean, everything... It was just a bonkers time. 14 guys on this 12-person bus. And I mean, and yet it's probably one of my fonder tour memories you know what i mean that's always how life works right like these these absurd in the moment you're like this is terrible i can't believe this is going on and then you get 10 years from it and you're like that was an amazing time (laughs) that That was a memory filled time yeah exactly that's the beauty of stuff like that i mean and it's also what builds character and you know helps you build like where you're going in life it's just the experiences you have and you you've got that in your back pocket now to have learned from and to have moved on into the music yeah that among many others but yes i mean that that particular summer was was a crazy time but yeah so we did I i think i was with them for seven years and it was awesome we were always kind of a weird underdog not in the middle kind of artist because we were this horn band so a lot of the a lot of the kind of traditional you know, the, the record labels and publishers yeah. were never really interested in what Denver was doing because it was so different. And yeah. it wasn't, there was no way to be like, well, how do we get this on the radio? So we're not getting this on a radio. The stations aren't going to play this. But yeah. we found ourselves doing these festivals and it would be somewhere in the afternoon along with these established artists. We were, we were a really good live show and we kind of quietly we're playing 100, 110 dates a year and, and really, really growing it. And yeah, it was, anyway, it was a really, I have really fond memory of that time. So well, I was with them for seven years. And then the last five years of my touring time was with Matthew West, yep. which was fantastic. And he's, and he's great. And I learned a lot about being a songwriter by playing his songs a hundred times a year yeah. and seeing how people responded. And I learned a lot about why people turn on the radio, uh, especially if you're talking about Christian music, you know, why they turn it on and what they're looking for. And I learned a lot of that being, you know, out with Matthew. While you're out on all these tours too, are you writing at the same time or or were you still kind of honing that craft while you were on the road? So when you came off a couple of years ago, is that when you focused more on writing or is this whole time you've been writing and and kind of developing in that sense as well? Yeah, no, it it was, it was both happening at the same time. I mean, I've been, I guess, a professional writer, you know, 
I'm starting my 10th year of okay. doing that. So yeah, I was in the middle of my time with Denver's band. It would have been, I think, 06 or 07 when I got my first publishing deal. Very cool. So I was working on them at the same time. So yeah, like there's artists that I met on the road. There was a girl, Lindsay McCall, who I met out on a Casting Crowns tour that Matthew mm -hmm. did. And we wrote a lot of songs together. I ended up producing the bulk of her last record that she put out. I met the Royal Taylor guys on the road, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and we, you know, we had a couple songs together that did pretty well on the radio. And yeah, there were a lot of relationships that sort of happened on the road where they were writing and some production opportunities that came from that. And you know, it's just, I mean, I, it's not a huge, it's not a huge group of people that's doing this, you know, like between the artists and musicians and producers. Like you meet people easily being on the road. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So you were not only just playing in Matt's band, you were also a music director, yes. right? Yes. Yes, I was. I, I, had, I know I've met you on and off a few times, and I think you've been in various stages of doing all sorts of things each yeah. time I've met you. So I think the first time we actually like worked together, worked together, was on uh, Into the Light, Matthew Yeah, West. on Matthew's record. That's right. Yeah. So that you is actually, right. So in addition to just playing... On the road, you, you've done studio stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, as, as a player. Um, yeah, and that was cool. And that's, I mean, that's a testament to Matthew, too. I mean, there, were, there was a period of time. I think his live band, we made his entire, I mean, I think he's had another Christmas record since this. But we did a whole Christmas record together where he had the live band track it. And then his band tracked, I think, about half of the Into the Light yep. record. Yeah. So yeah, so that was great. I mean, and that doesn't always happen. You know, in fact, that rarely happens where the live, the guys who are out touring end up having kind of being able to put their thumbprint on what the next record sounds like and yeah. just playing. And so again, I mean, like being in the studio, I was learning about production. I was producing some stuff at the same time, but you know, as with all things, you get with someone who's done it for a lot longer than you and on a higher level and you learn things. And I was so, yeah, I mean, it was, I was really fortunate that my touring time intersected with the studio and with being a songwriter the way that it did. And I recognize that that's not always how it goes for yeah. everybody who's on the road. And I'm really thankful for that because I was able to learn a lot of things that I use every day now you know, just from being on the road. Even when I got off the road, like my first year off, I, I didn't realize how well it was going to lead into my time just being in town, being a producer. What caused the transition into coming off the road? Was it like family and it's time to, hey, maybe stay locally? Or was it just like you were feeling like you needed a new adventure in life? Yeah, I mean, I think, gosh, I think it was a lot of things. You know, I think on one level, any like artists go through evolutions. Yeah. And there was, you know, one of the guys who was in Matthew's band had gone back to school and he, he had decided probably six months prior to that, that it was his time to just be out of music. He felt like he was being led in a different direction and his family needed to do something else. And, and I think we had had such a, a close knit group on the road that, you know, sometimes you pull out one piece and you can't really replace one piece. The whole dynamic changes. I'd probably been thinking about being off the road for a year, mm -hmm. and Matthew knew that, and he was really supportive of what I was doing writing-wise and studio-wise, obviously, because he was having me yeah. and be involved, and, you know, he... Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, I think it was just it was just the convergence of a host of factors, like yeah. Matthew thinking, maybe I want to do a different thing live, and yeah. maybe that's different people, and, and me kind of going, I think you know, at some point this jump needs to happen. Yeah. And there is, there is that leap of faith thing because you, you know, just strictly on a paying your bills level, you walk away from, you know, playing a hundred shows a year and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, that's yeah. this, it's this scary thing. Yeah. And it's, and it's a real thing. Like it's, you know, it feels like guaranteed income, even though nothing in the music business is guaranteed. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, you but you knew you'd ha you always had those dates. Yeah, in the back of your head is like, yeah. well, I'm going to have this many dates and yeah. then I've got to make this much money producing to make it make sense, whatever. But as with all as with I shouldn't say all things, but with many things, it was absolutely the right time. Yeah. So the window of opportunity opened and you just you were like, yeah, okay, I'm going to take just, I'm going to take this. Yeah, it, you know, there's doors that you like walk through and then there's doors that you're sometimes pushed through. Yeah. And, you know, the, like me getting off the road when I did felt like a door that, I don't know, I was probably, you were half pushed. I was half pushed. Yeah. I, it was like the door I ended up being stumbling through. Yeah, and yeah. You, you were get, going already, but someone yeah, gave you it's a like, helping well, hand to yes, go through. Here, here's, here's your next season and you wanted to do this totally on your own terms, but. So going through that door, it landed you into writing and producing 
absolutely full time. Mm-hmm. You're completely off the road. Yeah. So what what were your first projects you were working on as you came off the road there? Like what did, what did you come off the road and walk right into? Yeah. Man, I'm trying to remember. I I actually that Lindsay McCall record that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. I bet we were working on that when I was finishing my time on the road. Like that was probably one of the transition things. And and again, you know, I'd had a I'd had a publishing deal for six years prior to me being done on yep. the road. So there were a lot of artists that I've worked with for a long time and people that I was writing songs for that, you know, nothing in those relationships felt like it changed with me being home. Yep. Because I was writing songs anyway and that wasn't a new thing. So I will say it would have been harder if I was starting from the ground floor. Yeah. You know, like full time on the road and then full time studio. I was kind of full time both. Yeah. And, and so you were just now directing more attention into one area. You were just yeah. removing the other one and just going, okay, I'm going to focus right here now. Yes. The, this is my whole, there is no division of time. Yeah. Which was good creatively too, mm-hmm. you know, to just have, to be thinking about songs and about records. And, but yeah, it was, you know, gosh, I'm, yeah, just going to, it was, it's kind of a crazy thing. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a big change in life. I mean, going from being away from home, I mean, I know I have friends that have relationships, too, that work better when one party is away for a long time <laughs> or anything like that, you know, so I mean... My even marriage just, is not not that way. Well, so, yeah, so, I mean, it affects everyone a little bit differently, you know, just being back and, you know, I have friends, too, that they really, you know, love the time of being able to just escape for a minute and just play shows and not have to think about right. writing or deadlines or anything like that. Yep. It's just like, hey, I know exactly what I'm doing every night. I'm playing, you know, playing the same song, same yep. chords, you know, it's just very comfortable. Yep. And then, yeah, like you were saying earlier, to come off the road like that, it's kind of like, you know, all the safety measures have been thrown aside and like, here we are, yes. right, right into the real world. Let's go ahead and let's just, let's just see what happens. Yeah. But again, I think there's something when you're forced into a spot of this is now how you're making your living. Yeah. You have to be sort of driven to do this. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know too many like truly nine to five people that are super successful in music. So you you just, you figure it out and suddenly projects appear and rights appear that weren't appearing before. Yeah. Some of that's because you're five days a week in the studio now instead of three or, yep. you know, in and out of town. Yeah, people um, know you're available. People know you're around yep. and they start calling you for things. And, you know, on, on that, it's really natural in that way. Yeah, absolutely. So as you're transitioning off the road, while you were writing, like writing and producing often goes somewhat hand in hand yeah. with each other. But when you go into like producing other people's projects as mm-hmm. well, do you do a lot of producing of stuff that you don't write or is it mainly on tunes you've started writing and then everyone's just such a huge fan of where it's gone? They just like have you continue with the production and just finish it out? Or, or do you do like a little bit of both? What's, what's your approach like there? Yeah, I would say I'm more, I mean, no definition is perfect, but... I would say I'm more in the songwriter producer category mm-hmm. as opposed to the producer songwriter. Most of my production things have been connected to my songs. And I was getting more cuts earlier on in my career before I was getting opportunities to produce those things. You know, partially because that's, you know, I was younger, I was newer. And, and, and you're on the road too. Yeah, and I was on the road. Yeah. And, and it just, you know, I will say there is something about being around all the time that maybe makes people trust you more. Oh, yeah. That like, well, he, oh, he's off the road. He must be. It must be working. Well, for as much as the music industry is a very relationship-based yes. industry, so to be able to go have lunch and put in the FaceTime with people, I mean, that's a big thing. And when you're on the road, that's harder you know, to do. Four or five days a week, yeah, it's definitely harder to sit down, have those meetings, mm-hmm. have the breakfasts or the you know the lunches or whatever, and just you know continue to to nurture those relationships. Yes, absolutely. And I think as time has gone on, and as music has changed too. I mean, yeah. that's you know the way we're. Making making records now, there are far more multi-multi-producer records Mm -hmm. than there used to be. Like, I feel like when I got started, you know, nine or ten years ago, a multi-producer record was two most of the time. Not on everybody, but, you know, now it's not uncommon to have four or five producers on a record. I was going to say, I think the first five or six years I worked in music, it was just like, we were doing the whole record. Right. That, that's just how it was. Yep. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, okay, we'll bring in, we'll split a record or whatever. We'll do halves and halves. And yep. yeah, now it's like, yeah, two, three here, two, three there. Yep. You know, just getting, a lot of times it is based on the writer too. Like, yep. hey, so-and-so's got a killer vibe going already. We'll just keep it going there. And, you know, now two, three songs, one song here and there. It's just, yeah, it's a conglomeration. And Nashville 
is becoming more like LA has been a long time yep. in approach where A&R guys and artists are more open to if a demo is heading down the right road, then maybe we should just chase that further and, and finish it and make it a master absolutely as opposed to starting over from scratch because you know the truth is like there have been some instances where i did a demo label artists decide to go a different road with a different producer mm -hmm. and then they ended up coming back and it was like there's something about this that we didn't beat in the other version can yep. you finish it and usually it's painless at that point you put it in another day or two add stuff to the track maybe recut the vocal Maybe not. I mean, sometimes yeah. the demo vocal is really good. Yeah, sometimes there's just that mindless emotion that's in it that, you know, yeah. no one's overthinking it, overdoing anything on it. It's just in the moment and the performance is just well, there. That, yeah, I mean, so that Matt Hammett track that we did together. Yeah. Tears. Yeah, so Matt Hammett, Tears. You should listen to it. <laughs> Download debut it now. Full, debut <laughs> full circle music artist. <laughs> exactly. Right, there you go. So um, that's a great example. Like I, I, that whole demo vocal, we didn't touch the piano, I mean, the, that that was the demo, and then you and I got together. Yeah, and we just and, embellished. Yeah, and it was, we spent, I think, probably four or five hours, like, blowing it out a little more, cut a couple harmony things, and then the string stuff. But, I mean, you know, that's, I think that song's a perfect example of, like, a modern music business demo to record kind of song. And the way I think it, you know, it doesn't always go that way, but... Uh, more and more it's going that way. I wanted to touch too on, on something you said which resonates a lot with how Seth and I and Full Circle Music goes. We don't even really focus on making demos anymore. Right. Pretty much when you're making your demo, you're always shooting for the master quality anyway. I mm -hmm. mean, is that how you kind of approach it to putting your best foot forwards at all times? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, yeah, I think you have to. And I, and I think sometimes there is artists that don't want to hear the finished totally like finished finished thing from the first version of the demo yeah but yeah i mean i think that's just the world we're in you want to have it as close to finished as your artist wants it to be well, especially if they're walking into a song meeting where your song is going to stand up next to 56 other songs Absolutely. and it's going to get you, you know whether you get the cut matters. or the yeah you're going to get the cut or the production job out of like where it stands and the you know the balance of these other tunes yeah i i tend to look at like i don't think there's demos i think there's record stage one that's yeah. what i call it yeah stage one means i've done a lot of this track you know sometimes if the artist comes in and we write a song I might have a very basic kind of track going. Some some producers like really create more elaborate tracks sometimes before sessions. Yeah. I sometimes do that, but I'm at my core I'm such a song guy. I like I want to be able to just sit down with an acoustic guitar or a piano yeah. and play the song. So I might have a beat going, I might have a sound or two, but they're they're typically not too elaborate, which means oftentimes I'm creating the bulk of the track where it's just it's just me working on it mm -hmm. so you're doing it without a whole lot of feedback from the artist and the label yeah so it's always stage one because it's like this is without a whole lot of input yeah yeah and things are going to change and they're going to move because you decide oh man the second verse lyric needs to be different or there shouldn't be a down chorus here it should actually stay energetic the whole time yeah. or the label said the intro needs to be shorter or we need to approach it differently altogether mm -hmm. but you want to make sure the vocal sounds great. You want the mix to be as good as you can make it. Yeah. You want, you know, you have to put time in mm -hmm. at every stage of the process. When you're working on these, so you've got stage one and you send it out. How, how many like revisions or different stages will it normally go through before you find out, okay, hey, we're going to go through with this cut or however that ends up playing out? Man, I feel like there's no good answer to that question. I've had things, there's a song on the radio right now that the track... I don't think I changed anything about the track from the first demo to on the radio. Yep. Like the track was exactly the same. Mm -hmm. We recut part of a vocal. We did some other ad libs. Like it was all vocal things at yeah, that yeah. point. And then, you know, and then it was mixed by Sean Moffat mixed that, who's mm -hmm. a fantastic mix guy. Can you say the name of the song? Oh, uh, yeah, it's called Fearless. It's okay. by Jasmine Murray, her, cool. her debut single, which I'm really happy with. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's one of those that like everything sort of clicked early on and then it was just you know everybody everybody seemed to like how it was sitting and then there's some great like the label had some great feedback about hey man what if we need a bigger vocal moment for her something that shows her off more and we need the ad libs to feel a little bit different and yep. can we recut this and i thought that was a great team like taking something that's good initially and 
a team making it better than yeah. I would have made it on my own. Absolutely. And the city is very much about collaboration. I know, yes. at, at, you know, we've talked about it some, uh, Seth, Seth talks about it a lot. Just It's such an industry where collaboration just breeds just a lot more success than you could find on your own. Finding people who are strong where you're weak or just having any sort of extra input to just overall make the final product even better. Yeah. It's just it becomes so pivotal and it's great to just hear that other people find it to be that way too because i think a lot of people first starting in music approach it on their own like Mm -hmm. they don't they don't look to others for any kind of help or anything like they'll look to youtube or you know universities or whatever but a lot of times they forget to look to their peers or people they can look up to that have other experience because they feel like they need to approach it alone yeah and i think i mean i do think there's a point where you and i definitely was doing this earlier on in my career, but even when I was in college, when I was younger, you do want to find out how much you can do by yourself. Yeah. And you do want to develop that skill to where you can walk into a room with another person, whether it's the first co-write you ever had, or whether, you're, whether you've been a writer for 10 years, kind of confident of what your skills are and, and where you feel like you know yourself on some level and what you have to offer and where you're weak. But yeah, then, I mean, there's, you know, most of the time, uh, great things are made by teams of people. I feel like that's more the norm yeah, yeah. than an unbelievable thing only being made by one person, which ha- it happens, but it's more rare. And I also think like having a team in, you know, speak into a song, if it becomes a hit or whatever, that's more easy to repeat. Yeah. You know, cause there's times when you're going to carry more of the weight. There's times when someone else is going to carry more of the weight, but that mutual respect and understanding that you do better work as a team whether it's co-writers, artists, labels, the whole thing, you do better work together than, than you can do, you know, kind of putting your stick in the ground and saying, this is how it's going to be. This, yeah, exactly. Because, you know, then if it doesn't work, it's only your fault. Yeah. It, yeah, exactly. So you mentioned, you know, you feel that it's important for people to kind of find out what their limits are. How, how did you kind of find where your limits were at when you were hmm. first starting? One really tangible thing from a writing standpoint that I've that I've gotten a lot better at over the years, but I remember shortly after signing my first deal, and it's, it's funny, like uh, maybe three or four months ago, I was going back through a bunch of old songs, and so many of them were terrible. <laughs> so what I noticed, something that I did well, was I could see an idea, like someone would have a song title or just an idea for a song, mm-hmm. and I could pretty somewhat easily see the map, what I call the map of the song. Like, here's content-wise where we're gonna be in the first verse, Mm -hmm. here's how the chorus is gonna pay off, here's how the second verse can unfold, and you know, here's where the bridge can go. And I could like see that and know how to execute that. Mm -hmm. My problem was some of the ideas I was coming up with were not great ideas. So I ended up with a bunch of well-executed songs that nobody would care about because the core idea wasn't great and i remember my first publisher i think about i literally still think about this all the time i played him a song once and he said to me he's like man that's a really well executed song that makes me go so what like got to the end of it it was like it it had he called it the so what factor like it had a high so what factor it didn't impact me emotionally it didn't reveal something that was new musically it didn't go to a fresh place, whatever. It was like well executed. You pulled off the lyric well, the chorus goes up and all the melodies function well. And and all the pieces are in place. All the pieces are in place. And on paper, this is a quote unquote good song, but it doesn't hit me. And at the core of it was, man, this idea was not really worth writing about. So a lot of my, you know, on a lyric end, my journey has been finding better ideas. Like, is this, is this truly a great idea? Or is this just, you know, something you can put rhymes to yeah and the great ideas are always the songs that have the most impact and they're the ones that make people pull to the side of the road and that that's been a big you know that was a weakness early on for me so with something though as intangible as having a great idea how do you work to develop making like having stronger ideas for messages or content in your songs like how how do you go about honing that skill once you've once you realized like that was your weakness what, yeah. what did you do to kind of like sharpen that part of your game well some of i mean i think some of it was i think i got to be in the room with people who were better at it than me yeah and had better ideas and so what would happen is sometimes you'd have people uh, someone who had a great lyric idea but they weren't a great executor yeah like they didn't necessarily have 
their strength wasn't how to flesh out the lyric details. Mm -hmm. And I was always better at that. And, and so cuts early on in my career, like some of those, the best songs were like, I look at those and I go, that was not my idea. But I took that idea and together we were able to execute it pretty well. You know, I, I think I've gotten a lot more disciplined about writing down anything that hits me. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I literally have a file on my iPhone of just a lot of song titles that I haven't written yet. They're just titles. Yep. I'll be in a, in a movie or I'll be at church, I'll be at, at, I try to not do it at meals with people because I'm trying to be away from my phone more in yeah. general. But anytime something hits me emotionally, like if I think it could connect to a song, I want to jot that down. I want to not lose that bit of inspiration because going into a co-write at 10 in the morning and counting on inspiration to show up is hard. Yeah. Like part of being a pro is showing up when it's time to work and doing the work. Yeah. But arming yourself to do that is often about catalog, well, I'd call it cataloging inspiration. Mm -hmm. This was a moment that mattered to me. And this was something I thought of. I'm gonna write this down and I'm not necessarily gonna develop this right now, but I'm gonna remember that, oh man, this particular title that I thought of or this scene in this movie, I felt this thing, I, whatever. Yeah. And coming back to those later when it's time to write a song mm -hmm. as opposed to like what do we want to write about yeah i don't know i don't really feel a whole lot right now i mostly just need coffee and yeah. <laughs> you know i think that's helped me have better ideas and then the other thing i know i'm talking a lot about this but i think it's so this is important i mean yeah. a lot, this is what a lot of people want to know because a lot of people don't understand or like we talked about earlier don't have the maybe foresight to acknowledge that there are things they might need to work on or that they might need to have other people involved that are more experienced than them for them to learn from and you know to to find those pieces that they didn't even know were weak to begin with and then hone and sharpen those pieces to just bring their overall product up their their songwriting or producing whatever it is just to bring that up in value yep so, i mean this is great i think the other thing that has really helped me is being a better listener and one of the things that I really do intentionally with artists now when they're over to write is try to listen to them better than yeah. I used to and, and get them talking because, you know, the best songs come from real places. And I think artists are often, even if they're great writers, artists are often full of ideas that they're not aware that they're full of. Mm -hmm. And if I can create a space for them to feel safe emotionally yep. and just get them talking, try to ask good questions. And y often you can find these slivers of ideas that can be real gold if you just listen well. Working harder on ideas and, I'm, and being a better listener are probably two of the more significant things that have changed for me from when I first started to where I am now. And I think, I mean, there's so many songs that have come from just listening and not feeling like just because you're the songwriter, you have to have the idea for the day. Yeah. You might have an idea. I mean, often you might have an idea coming in and then that's not the idea you're going to write today because of what's going on in the room. And then other times it is the idea you're going to write. Yeah. But yeah, but the listening, I, I think the listening piece has been big for me too. That's great. So... You've had tons of success as both songwriter and producer, Grammy nominated, I don't know, I don't Dove know. Award nominated, uh, countless number ones. What what have been some of your favorite experiences now that you've you've established yourself as a as a very successful songwriter and producer? And one thing that a lot of people often wonder because because there's no real metric for success. Mm -hmm. You know, now that you've you've come ten years, twelve years into your journey in music. How do you look at what you've accomplished so far and kind of gauge where you're at? Because I think a lot of people don't often know how to gauge their progress as they're working, you know, working yeah. through their career or working to get into music and, you know, create something where there's no tangible means to actually, you know, measure success. Because yeah. it could be so many different things, like some could, people could look at money or sales or, or awards or whatever as success. So how do you approach that? Like, how do you track how you're doing or, you know, where you want to go based on what's going on in your life? That's a great question. Yes, yeah, so I will say something that I think, it's funny how you can achieve something that you either were dreaming of or working toward, mm -hmm. and then you get it and you don't feel any different, Yeah, you know? 
And that's really, I've been, I, honestly, I've been dealing with some of that really recently for me about what's my identity. If my identity is just in being a songwriter, I'm probably going to be miserable most of the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, and I think which dovetails into the kind of idea you're talking about, about defining success. I think, you know, I, I can only speak for me, but I imagine this is true for most people. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't have a definition and a measuring stick for this is what success is, then you will, you will feel like you're failing most of the time. Because if you have success, it wasn't big enough. If you, you know, you shoot for something and you get it, but it like, well, was that the right thing to, anyway, yeah. you know, so for me, I still think the best definition for what success looks like on a yearly basis is the one I had when I was 19. And that was me at a, as a sophomore at Belmont going, man, what I'd really love to do is make a living playing music. I've been able to do that for every year since then. But if I start thinking about success as, well, I need this person to cut my song. I need to produce this record. I need this thing to do this. I get really distracted and mostly what I get is bitter and insecure and I am so far away from looking at what my core goal was. My core goal was to make a living doing this. Why am I making a living doing this and miserable? Yeah. Or and always comparing myself to other people. Yeah. Wondering if I'm good enough. Wondering if I measure up. Well, can I, how can I get to the next level, quote unquote, whatever mm-hmm. that means. Mm-hmm. Because I'm at the next level right now compared to where I was a few years ago. Yeah. And I don't necessarily feel any better because I'm at the next level. Mm-hmm. You know, If my eyes are not on man, if I can do this for one more year and make a living, like take care of my family by writing songs and making records, that gives me something that I should be grateful for. And if I don't practice gratefulness, then every, everything else will creep in and get louder. Yeah. My, like I said, my insecurity, my fears, my do I measure up? All those voices get really loud if I'm not looking at what my core definition of success was, which yeah. is, did you make a living doing this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Everything else needs to bow to that on some level. And it's not that you shouldn't have goals. You have to have goals. Absolutely. But if not accomplishing a certain goal can make you feel like you haven't ever accomplished anything at all, which is often what happens to me. Mm-hmm. Oh man, this guy didn't cut my song. And I feel like nobody has ever cut my song. And I go from like a guy who's been able and really fortunate to make a living for a while doing this. And then I just feel like I've never had anybody like anything I've ever done. Does that make sense? I think it, I think it absolutely makes sense. I think, I think you make a good point. Like a lot of people just starting out too, they assume that they have to, you know, have a number one or whatever, like right out the bat to be successful. And yes. A lot of times having so lofty of a goal can set you up for almost failure is if, yeah. if I'm taking for what from what you're saying here. Yeah, or just if you can't if you can't define it. Yeah. Like I just think a concrete definition. And and that definition can evolve over time. I'm not saying that, you know, for me, that one I had when I was nineteen, that's been probably the best, easiest measured one for me. That doesn't mm-hmm. mean that that's true for everyone, it just means it's true for me. Yeah. But yeah, if you say, Well, I want to be as successful as this other songwriter, I don't know what that means. Like you want to make as much money as them? Yeah. Or or you want people to talk the same way about you, or you want to work on big rec like th- there's really it's nebulous. Yes. You know? And whenever I'm in that nebulous place where I can't define what it is that is working for me, I mostly feel like I'm failing. And yeah. again, that could just be me, but I don't think it is. Yeah, I don't think you're alone in that. Yeah. No, that's great, man. So you mentioned earlier that, you know, focusing too much in on songwriting, like you, you like to show up prepared and mm-hmm. 110% ready to go, but then when your day is done, to be able to unplug and unwind a little bit. Like yeah. you said, you were trying to get better about doing that stuff. Are there things like, I know that you, you know, you write, you produce all day, every day, you've, you know, come off the road, you've done so many different things in music. Are there other continuing things you do in music that are maybe outside of just writing and production and stuff like that to just kind of give you an extra release into your creative realm though? I mean, one of the things that, that wasn't 
a really unexpected, uh, something was really out of left field when I got off the road. My wife and I go to Midtown Fellowship yeah. Church here in Nashville. And shortly after I was done, the church um, sort of announced that they were going to plant a new little congregation in East Nashville, yep. where I live. And so we were part of the core group of like 25 of us that committed really early on to like, we, we will do this, we will help launch this, we will be all in, you know, from the ground floor on it. I've been on staff with the church for just under, I guess about two years now. It's very part, it's as part time as something can be, but I lead worship almost every week. Yeah. The, the last time I'd led worship before our church started two years ago, I think I was 19 or 20 and I was in college. I mean, I felt when the guy who's the pastor at Midtown East asked me to do this, I was kind of like, I understand that I'm sort of musically equipped to do this, but I think you might have the wrong guy. <laughs> or that's what I was thinking in my heart. You know, yeah. I was like, I'm totally not ready to do this. And, you know, two years into it, I still don't know if I'm ready to do this. <laughs> yeah. But what I do know is it's helped me. I think when you're in the music business, it's really easy to lose the heart of why you got into it in the yeah. first place. Because instead, not instead of, look at this great song I wrote, it becomes about more than that. It becomes about, you know, well, did this guy, cut, did they, all the things I was just saying, did this guy cut the song? Did I make enough money doing this? Did, is it, yeah. am I doing, I don't know. It's 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 It becomes a lot of things besides music. Yeah, the pure, the purity original, of it. Yeah. And church music was such a big part of my youth that what I found probably like five or six months into leading worship every week was it was this other musical thing. It was still using the gifts that I have. It was in, it was in the wheelhouse of what I think the Lord's made me to do, but it was not the music business. And it was about people and it was about leading a group of people to do something together. And it's been really, really good for my heart to remember that music is bigger than the business. Yeah. And whether you're making a living or not from the music you make, mm -hmm. I will be making music and I, gosh, I'm, now I'm, I'm so, I'm becoming more and more passionate about, about the church and about my role there. Yeah. I'll be thinking about those things and making music long after I'm not making money from it anymore. Yeah. I think being... I don't know. Yeah, I th I, I, this role has helped me rediscover that a little bit, that it's not just a tool to help provide for my family, but it's, you know, music's a really big, beautiful thing. And it's, and it's just amazing, like, in a city full of music makers, how easy it is to forget that. Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure, have you led worship and any of your own songs come into play in these, uh, in these settings? Man, uh, so, God, it's funny you ask that. Literally two weeks ago was the first time I've done a song of mine. I did this one Christmas song. Christmas is different though. Christmas, yeah, Christmas. is different. <laughs> I'm so trepidatious about it. Yeah. It's it's literally I and it's for a couple things. One, I'm just insecure and I just don't, you know, there's times where I'm like, ah, my songs, I don't know if they're any good or whatever. But also, I mean, on a deeper level, I want there to be no mixed motivation oh, absolutely. when I'm leading at church about like what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Like that would that would that would greatly disappoint me if anybody who goes to church in midtown thought that there was any kind of agenda except leading a song that people should I, that i think people should be singing yeah, on a yeah. given week so i took this song and i sent it to one of the other midtown worship leaders my friend carly who i affectionately dub carly who hates everything <laughs> and she doesn't like a lot of songs and and i knew i was like if i send this to carly and she likes it then I'm going to feel, I just had a feeling about the song and, and just something in my heart was like, I think, I mean, I think we should sing this, but it's my song. I feel weird about it. Yeah. So I said, Carly, Carly's basically going to be the judge. And she replied and was like, I love this. I want to lead this at our 12 South location. I think you should, I think you should do this. I think you should feel fine about it. So we did it two weeks ago and it was, it was really impactful even for me. I was talking with my publisher this morning about it, like the kind of the multi-level impact that it had on my own heart, just being able to lead my own song and have people really respond to it. Well, it I'm was sure, really beautiful. I'm sure it gives you, you know, you to just see it impact, you know, in, from the place that you wrote it from yes. initially, just from the heart and just to see it reach other people in the same facet has to be, you know, just a an intense emotion. Yeah. I mean, I think that's true about a lot of songs and I've had... I've heard stories about songs of mine that have been on the radio that have affected people, yeah. which I'm beyond stunned by. You know, you like, that's a beautiful thing. You really have no idea when you write something, what the impact is going to be. Yeah. Um, and I'm constantly floored that people 
would connect with some songs in the way that they do. Cause it's just, I feel like mostly a, you know, like I said, kind of an insecure, not very talented mess of a human. And so the fact that somebody, somebody's story connects with something he wrote is amazing, but it is even, I, there is something about your church. Yeah. It feels even more personal on some level. Oh, absolutely. It goes, well, it's such an intimate moment. Yeah. You know, when everyone's there worshiping together and just sharing, you know, in a feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a special, you know, it's a special thing. I can't, I'm not, I know I'm not being very eloquent and everybody who's listening is probably like, this guy's not speaking very well, but it's hard to pin down exactly. But it's, it was significant for me. I'm still kind of processing what it all means, but it was just, it was, it was just a beautiful moment that I feel like the Lord kind of gave, gave me and I'm really yeah, so I'm I'm hoping to be more open to using my own songs, but I'll probably still run them by Carly first because because oh. she'll tell me if it's not any good. Well, it sounds like she's a reliable, she, Car- a Carly, reliable Carly who hates everything. <laughs> yes, it's a it's she's she's a valuable resource. So what what does the future hold for you now, man? So you've come you know you've come off the road now you're full on writing, producing, leading worship at, yep. at this church. So so what's next for you? What do you have coming up? What's weird is I just started my tenth year of being a professional songwriter. Yeah. And I feel like I'm, I don't know, I feel like I'm just starting to maybe get better at this. Yeah. A lot of that is the idea thing that we were talking about earlier. Like, I feel like I'm more tuned into what's what's a good idea, what's a song worth writing. So I want to keep being, I don't know, I, I want to keep writing songs that people care about. I think more and more about heart in songs. I had my first kid 13 months ago, my son, my son Clay, and ever since he's been born, I don't know. And I think any parent would probably say there is this sort of deeper place in your heart that emerges. Yeah. And I've felt music connect to that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I want to keep, I don't know. I mean, gosh, I know this probably sounds like a terrible stock answer, but like, I want to keep learning how to write better songs and move people in ways that matter to them. And I want to keep making better records. I want to keep growing as a producer and getting more sonically interesting and, you know, serving artists and songs well. And I think the moment you think you've arrived and you figure something out is the moment that you start to do work that's not as good. Yeah. And I think it takes a long time. I think some people get it faster. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've just never been one of those people. Like my whole career has been small step by small step, inch by inch, slowly learning how to make, uh, you know, better songs and, and mm-hmm. records that people want to listen to. And I want to keep doing that. And I want to, you know, and with church music, it's like, I, I want to, two years ago, I had very little interest in writing worship songs because I didn't have any context for them. Yeah. And now it's one of the things that I'm thinking more and more about. And I'm very much on the front end of that for me. So, I mean, I, I guess one thing that I want to do more of that maybe is a change is spending more time in those kind of places and hopefully with those kind of people and learning from a different group of songwriters than just the radio, you know, yeah. but gosh, I feel like that's such bad. Yeah. No, I, I wish I, I had something cooler to say. <laughs> oh, but I mean, I think it, it nails on a very, you know, a very prominent point in the music industry or in, in just life in general is that you, you just never stop learning. Yeah. You, know, you never stop learning. You've never gone all the way that you can go. You know, it's every day. I mean, for people like yourself, as successful as you've been, there's still more to do, more to learn, you know, more, more to just absorb, you know, it's never done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, again, it's like you say, a person as successful as yourself talking about me. And I'm like, who are you talking <laughs> about exactly? Because I certainly don't feel, you know, I guess that arrival thing. Like, I don't I don't feel that you never feel like you've arrived. Yeah, That's uh, the first sign of danger. I, think. <laughs> I really believe that. Absolutely. Well, because hunger is such a driving force, especially in this industry where there's so many people competing to mm-hmm. just, you know, to get their songs on records or to get, you know, the production gig or the mixing gig or anything yeah. like that. Having the hunger and the willingness to like never settle for anything or never consider yourself the authority on anything mm-hmm. is, you know, it's a very powerful force. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I hope I never, I just hope I really never think that I've got it figured out and that if somebody says a song needs to be tweaked that I don't, I don't ever think, well, I mean, no, it doesn't. Yeah. It's fine. You know? I was writing with an artist the other day who's such a, I mean, gosh, he's one of the most talented people I know. And he is such a poker and a prodder with songs. And he called me the next day and like, man, I don't, maybe we're not doing the second verse right. Maybe. So, you know, almost always something can get better. Yeah. 
And if you don't know how it can get better, someone else can probably help tell you. You know, I've, I've really learned that more probably in the past two or three years than I, or I, I guess I've valued it more in the past two or three years than I did previously. Yeah. Like, let a friend, let, I mean, in, in this, you know, for me right now, it's like let A&R people, re, let their voice be really loud and let the artist's voice be really loud and let your co-writer's voice be really loud and, and look for look for ways to make things better. And, and just because somebody tells you your thing needs work or this song isn't good enough or this production isn't fresh enough or you're not the right guy, whatever, I've heard all these things, mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you're a failure. And it doesn't mean that you don't do good work. It mm-hmm. means that rarely is someone bulletproof on the first try. Yeah. That's great, man. That's a... It's a super solid point. I mean, that's and that's I think a lot of people often need to be reminded of that fact because they take you know they take criticism so harshly yeah. or you know they just get burdened down by. And I do too. I oh, mean, I'm saying this yeah, sitting I, on I a couch, we all do. yeah, clear like with a clear mind right now, where nobody's telling me that it's not good enough because yeah. I'll get told, oh, this isn't good enough, this isn't going to work, and it's like, oh gosh, I mean, I suck so much, and suddenly the fact that I've had songs on the radio or everything you mentioned earlier, it's like, doesn't matter. Yeah. doesn't matter yeah. because this guy right now doesn't think that this song is good enough. So I'm a total failure and everybody <laughs> else is better than me. It's like, that's not true. That's not true. It means I'm a human being and it means that music is a collaborative part process and other voices speaking into it are probably going to make it better. Yeah. And if you think every song that you write is great, like by definition, not every song is great. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you can't hit it out of the park every time and that's okay. Man. No, that's great, man. Dude, thank you for sharing all of this with us, man. It's yeah, been awesome. Man. So I got, we got one last question for you real quick. Yes. So, you know, you had mentioned that you in the beginning learned, you know, that you needed to work on your ideas and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. If, if you could offer one piece of advice or information to someone who's just now looking to get into the music industry, just looking to start, what piece of advice or piece of information would you offer them? Yeah, I think one of the best things that younger or newer songwriters can do is just do it all the time and treat it like a job. And that's why I think the thing I mentioned earlier about cataloging inspiration is important. Because if you make it your goal this year to write three songs a week, rarely are you going to be inspired at the same time of day three times yeah. in a week but the more you write the better you get and it really i've said for a long time like the, such a great analogy is it's like working out you know your muscles get more toned and more in shape the more you work out the more song i remember when i first signed my publishing deal and i was talking with my creative guy about how many songs i should write in a year and all that i was like my gosh 120 songs or whatever that's so many songs how do you have that many ideas well writing songs is like a muscle the more you do it the more ideas you find the 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 inspiration never runs out but i think you develop when you make it a job Mm -hmm. when you when you make it a habit like i don't know any successful music person in any field who sort of haphazardly does what they do like it's this is when i'm going to write songs today and if you're working a different job, it's like, cool. So this is the one and a half hour window I have four days a week or three days a week to write. Well, then do it and, and make that your habit. And you will be amazed at the progress you start making when you make something a regular part of your life, just as with anything else in life. Yeah. Dude, that's great, man. That's perfect. Jeff Pardo, thank you so much for joining us. It's yes. been a pleasure having you on the show. We look forward to hearing many more of your tunes and your productions, my friend. Thank you. It really is. It's an honor. It's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, this is X, and you've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This show is produced by the Full Circle Music Company with editing help from Jericho Scroggins and Jordan Salamoni. Head over to iTunes and leave us a good rating and a good review that helps us out more than you know. And thank you to those of you who have already done so. We'll see you on the next episode.